So welcome, welcome to the last class of preparing for the future of legal education, online teaching tips and techniques. My name is John Mayer and I'm the executive director of Cali. Um, and I just got a, a few housekeeping things that I wanted to get out at the front before we have our invited guest speak. Um, first of all, if, you, if, you've, if you've completed the class and the definition of completing the class is, for, is the following. If you've showed up to five, six or seven, five or more of these classes and filled in the, filled in the attendance link, then uh, we'll, we'll post your name at the end of the week as a, having completed the class and, and we'll create an, uh, an online certificate for you. For those of you who, who won't make that list or didn't make that list because you watched the videos or did the work, but not in the, not in the real time or not in the live synchronous version, um, we're gonna give you a final exam. And calm down, it's not gonna be that hard. Uh, we'll post more details about that in an email by the end of the week. Basically, we're gonna ask you, you know, what your experience was. Um, if you remember back when we started, um, I said there were three reasons why you might want to be in this uh, in this in this class in this mini course. It's highly likely that some part of your fall 2020 teaching will be online, um, and that teaching online is a skill. Teaching is a skill. Teaching online is a skill, and you, you need to practice that. And that there was two reasons for doing this mini course this way. One was we're covering material about teaching online, and your taking a class about teaching online online, which we hope will give you an experience of taking an online class that will give you empathy towards your students as you build out for, uh, for the fall. I believe, and many other people in the ed tech world also believe that online classes can be actually more accessible. They can be more interactive. They can be more convenient. They can be better than face-to-face -face classes. Uh, but that takes work and that takes practice. So let's do a poll. Elmer, would you uh, launch? I've got a couple of polls. This is the same poll uh, I had you guys do uh, on the first class. There it is. There's actually two questions to this poll. Everybody just jump in and, and answer away. So my feelings right now, I'm a little concerned about the fall. I'm freaking out or I'm not worried. I just want to expand my skills. And then the second question, go ahead, Elmer. I was just gonna say, John, we're collecting this particular poll da data anonymously. So if you, <laughs> so, so we won't know what you're, if you're freaking out or not. So in case you're, you know, worried about that, don't uh -huh. be. Sure, and then the second question, this fall my school is 100% online. Some online, some face-to-face, -face, all face-to-face, -face, but with appropriate measures being taken or I still don't know, and that's probably why you might be freaking out. <laughs> so Elmer, that was the first time the poll popped up and I actually saw the answers sort of come in and it was kind of cool. You know, to watch the lines like slide around and stuff like that. Um, it is kind of neat. We'll give it just a few more seconds here. A few more We're, seconds. Yeah, I like to get up to about ninety percent if I can. I need a few more people. I know you're out there. <laughs> oh, it looks like we've kind of we're only going to hit eighty-eight percent. All right. All right. I'm going to end polling, and we'll share the results. Right and there. Uh, and as you can see, um, if you, if you're sharing, if uh, yeah, if you're seeing the results, you know, um, I'm a little concerned about fall semester wins out. If I remember, I, and, I, and I probably should have grabbed the, actually I didn't grab the freaking out poll last time, but I do know it was a little bit higher than 10% um, last time. Um, I'm a little uh, uh, happy to see, not worried, just want to expand my skills is up to a third of you. That's great. That's great. Because calm is going to be the watchword for the next few weeks. And then this fall, my school is some online, some face-to-face, -face, more than 60% of you seem to or going that way, um, with uh, the we don't really know in second place at almost 20%. Ah, that's, that's still got to be uh, concerning, right? All right, I'm going to stop sharing results. Close that off. So 
we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and those of you in uh, California or the southern states, actually there aren't too many states where, where uh, the disease is not increasing. Um, it's not technically that much different from when we started this class or when we started this quarantine, uh, this isolation, way back in um, uh, March or April. Um, and so it, it, I, I, if, you're, if you're concerned or, or, or upset or, or uh, uh, not sure how things are going, you have a lot of, you have a lot of company in that. Um, so, so the goal of this class has always been to, to give you some skills, to give you some choices, to give you some options, um, and to also hopefully instill in you a little bit of a little bit of empathy for your online students, because you're you're you you're now going to go off and build your courses over the next couple of weeks, you know. And we wanted to give you a limited but a somewhat realistic look at how things were in an online class. We wanted to give you an array, a buffet of options for how you might do that, and we and we wanted you to feel like a student for a little bit. So we started this class with the intention of answering a question, you know, that uh, we, we knew as Cali, we knew things were going to get interesting this, uh, this summer and heading into this fall. So what could we do? Um, and, and, and we hastily, though, though uh, rapidly, you know, developed this course. But beyond this, the what can we do question is, is being asked of us again. And so starting this Friday, um, and for every Friday in July, we're going to hold an open house, uh, a law faculty tech open house every Friday in July. That's the five Fridays um, on Zoom. And uh, we'll be posting you know, the links and more information later. But we'll, we'll do demos. We'll answer questions. We'll have discussions. I've invited my friends, enemies, and colleagues of the technoid community to join us because um, despite the prodigious size of my brain, I do not know everything. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to be uh, uh, an easygoing sort of a way to explore some of the things and ask questions and even get little, little quick demos of, of stuff. So if you want to stop by at any point over the next five Fridays between two and four central time, um, please do. And we'll be happy to help you out in whatever way we can. So your instructors, and instructors is, uh, is just, uh, uh, you know, your coordinators, your course administrators have been Deb, uh, Elmer, and I, but really uh, this, this is Deb's wonderful piece of work. She's, I, I, I can't thank her enough for the amount of effort that she put into this. And Elmer's um, wonderful support in, in all these things. Um, it's not his fault that things were, that, that we had problems. It's his responsibility, however, um, and, and we've had to wrangle a lot of technology. Me, I'm just the uh, empty suit uh, wearing the Zoom School of Law t-shirt um, talking at you right now. I, of course, want to thank all of our guest speakers, of which there were too many to list and, and name, but they're, they're, they have been immortalized in the videos that we've saved on the website, um, including Julie, who will be speaking uh, at us in, in just a few seconds here. So. So that's all I've got to say. Uh, you will be receiving a course evaluation um, sometime this week as well. Uh, we want you to tell us uh, how it went, um, how we might improve such a thing as this. Um, you know, don't spare us. I know you won't. Um, and, uh, and, and any other ideas or suggestions you might have as to what Cali can do to help, uh, you know, legal education, law schools, our members, um, law faculty, you know, during these, uh, um, during these difficult times. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, um, um, and find, and find the, find the page that has, uh, Julie's information so I can introduce her. <laughs> ah, found it. So Julie Hewitt is joining us today. She is the Educational Technology Manager in the Division of Professional Studies at UW, U University of Wisconsin. I always say UW, University of Wisconsin Platteville. And she's got almost 20 years experience in this, uh, in this online game. She's got a PhD from Nova Southeastern. And fortunately for us, her dissertation was titled Blended Learning Faculty Professional Development 
incorporating knowledge management principles. So we couldn't think of a better person to, to close things off for us. And uh, with that, I'm, I, I'm delighted to welcome Julie to, uh, to our mini course. Go ahead, Julie. You're muted. <laughs> All right, this is better when I'm not muted, right? See? That's right. The experienced forget to unmute from time to time. It happens. Um, okay, let me see if I can get my screen to share. Okay, is it coming through okay on your side? All right, wonderful. Looking great. Okay, so um, this is me, my contact information as well. Um, so at the University of Wisconsin Platteville, I'm working primarily with a faculty, online faculty academy project right now where we are also gearing up like most institutions for the unknown. Um, <laughs> we don't necessarily um, have a set plan. It's in, it started in motion now. Um, it looks like this fall we'll be doing blended learning, um, which I, you know, from the poll there, looks like a lot of you are going to be in a similar situation. Um, but we also all recognize with what happened this spring, some things might change on a dime. What do we do? Um, how can we be best prepared if that happens? Um, so today I just kind of want to talk through um, some different situations and some different, I guess, recommendations for how you can prepare and think through. So some of those essentials that are uh, maybe the basics, some of them are going to touch on things that I know some of the other presenters also um, maybe touched on in their presentation. So hopefully it'll bring some of that together for you um, in closing um, as well. And uh, Deb was very kind to kind of give me some insights and a little bit of access. So I was able to see some of the discussions and kind of see some of the questions and the topics that came up um, as well. So how I've actually structured the presentation is um, going through, oops, let's try this, next slide, there it goes, um, to be able to try to address some of those. So um, in alignment with the session seven, um, by the end of this webinar, hopefully I'll give you some tools you can use to support your course planning, um, maybe even mention some activities. So there might be things that you've been thinking about, but hopefully revisiting them again might um, help you kind of gain some clarity on which ones you want to do, and then some new facilitation techniques or strategies that you, again, might have been presented, but you might want to think about how that is going to look in your classes. And as far as questions go, I will pause. <laughs> I will pause after each of the questions that I address for you to ask questions related to that topic, um, just to kind of have a few breaks and a chance for you to think about the items and the discussions that I'm talking about. So, um, so the first question Deb uh, threw at me was, <laughs> you know, how might one think about constructing a single class or a series of classes? You know, what does that look like? You're used to um, or accustomed to planning for the face-to-face -face instruction. So you, you have your textbook, you have your syllabus, you likely have slide decks of information, um, reading assignments that you've had them, uh, had your participants or learners, you know, uh, do and complete in the class. So now you are looking at, okay, what does this look like online? How can I think about how this transfers? Um, most people might be well aware from spring to moving it's not something you can necessarily do super quickly you can't just pick up one set and put it in the other environment because not everything transfers equally it's not apples to apples oranges to oranges so which things can be modified to still be effective which things might you consider um, to adapt or modify or maybe change up and take advantage kind of like john was saying um, there are some opportunities that you have in an online space that you might not have in the classroom. So kind of thinking about those. So what I really kind of let people know is think about what's in your toolkit. And when I mean that, I always, when I work with my students that are, you know, studying the education programs, I, I always call it our virtual toolkit. And as an instructor, you learn strategies, tips, techniques over time. Um, so you likely have a lot of those, you know, kind of in your pocket already. So it's not 
starting completely new, there's a lot of information that can be transferable. Um, you know, and starting with the core, you have a syllabus, you have your textbook, you have the resources. So you have good subject matter information. So it's just deciding how do I deliver this? How do I get the students to interact with it? And then how do I assess, you know, what they've been able to retain or, you know, what can they demonstrate from those activities? So when we're looking at that, um, a tool that I love to refer people to is a course mapping document. Really, it becomes your lesson plan, but for online education um, or even in blended modalities, you can break apart your lesson into the pieces and parts of what do I want to be synchronous? What do I want to be asynchronous? Okay, when I look at that, what pieces of information do I need? Um, in a face-to-face -face classroom, you might be used to walking in and kind of having it all there and ready and being able to you know adapt maybe a little bit on the fly but you have your basic plans you have um, materials ready when you're online a lot of that has to be prepared in advance so knowing what information what artifacts you might need or examples um, having it in a accessible format for online so that learners can either read it or download it or interact with it however they need to. So let's say if it was like a quiz or something like that where you wanted automated feedback, you have to have not only the questions in there, but the answers so that it can provide the automated feedback. So just really helping to capture what all do I need to be prepared. Um, and these documents, these course mapping documents tend to kind of help you think through that process so you're not having to um, struggle through what documentation you need. So when I think about it, and, and I don't have a lot of background, I will <laughs> disclose that. Um, but when I when I think about um, the people that I've interacted with that, that do, um, whether it be other faculty um, or just other professionals, they've, they're really good at organizing information and capturing those details and knowing what they need for each piece. So the leap to doing a course mapping really isn't a leap, it's more of a step just going, oh, okay, here's this new tool that I have that's specific for capturing that information and helps me think through that process. Um, I will show you an example of one in just a minute. Um, other course planning aids that you might use is there are um, a lot of different resources that I know have been shared in the former, um, some of the previous sessions about what types of activities can I do, what types of um, assessments can I do, what types of um, let's see, what type of engagement or interaction do I want my learners to have with one another, with me, um, just with the material itself. So having some of those references just to kind of stimulate your thought when you're feeling out, when you're filling out these documents is helpful because sometimes you get stuck into the either comfort zone or immediately comes to mind, oh, a reading assignment or some of those um, ways that either you have learned, which is what we usually have a tendency to do, or just the way we had kind of um, structured the class before, our first instinct is to go with that. And that's natural just because it's our comfort zone. But if you have some of these other resources just available to kind of trigger um, the decisions that you're making as you walk through the document, it's very helpful. So I like to have a couple of them um, just kind of at the ready so that I can, you know, keep myself um, aware and alert to being intentional about the activities I'm doing. Um, another thing to think about is some of the consistency. And I think this came up, I think I saw one discussion out there, at least at least one, about consistency in activities. So um, in your courses, you want to get into a rhythm or a, a, a plan so students know where they're going for information, what days activities are due. Um, those types of structural things, you don't want to be, you want to avoid that being a barrier to online learning. So that consistency in the way that you're doing things is very helpful when you're constructing that plan for your class. So for example, um, when I do discussions with students, I typically have them all do on, let's say, Wednesday. And then um, they need to respond to their peers by Saturday. Or I usually have a few days in between so they can kind of think about their responses, process, 
um, depending on your students, some may be balancing multiple things. <laughs> um, so when they have competing priorities, being able to have a little bit of time to process um, and do the asynchronous or the, the activities where you're not live is useful. Um, and then the same thing, like if your assessments or papers or other types of activities are due on a different date, but that's always consistent on the day of the week. Again, that adds value to your students and knowing where and when to get the information um, as well. We don't want to make the learning management system and where they're going to interact become a barrier to being successful. Um, other types of things that are in your toolkit are some of the fundamental models and theories. So I know um, one of the ones that I saw, and I was so excited when I saw, saw the other speaker's presentation, um, was the community of inquiry. So having that out there as a basic understanding that there's, there's different components to the classroom where it, in your classroom, when you're face-to-face, -face, you have an instructional presence. So you have that, um, when you walk in, you're there, you're approachable, you can establish your rapport and greeting students as they come in. Um, so that teaching presence is, is there by, I don't wanna say default, but somewhat because you're there. Um, in the online space, that's not necessarily there for granted. So you have to be more intentional about what type of interactions am I doing? What helps remove? And in the um, literature, it's called the transactional um, distance. So making the learners not feel like they're siloed or isolated because they, there is a physical distance between you. Um, being able to bring them closer through activities, conversations, discussions, dialogues, um, that helps um, not only engage the learner with retention, um, being more comfortable asking questions, um, being able to uh, openly share and have that trust that needs to be established. That same thing happens with their interactions with one another. Um, so the social interactions that happen in the course are important and the way that they can engage and um, learn from one another, reinforce concepts if they're doing peer reviews and they're actually doing some peer teaching or discussions. Um, so another way to be able to engage with that. And then the third piece is the, is the cognitive piece or that subject matter. And again, that is really fundamental when you're looking at your overall course plan. So as you think about your map and you start having all these activities planned out, you can think about, okay, where in this are they interacting with me? Where in this are they interacting with each other? Where are they interacting with the content and subject matter in a way that it's distributed so it's not overwhelming in one presence, but yet each of those are there that adds to the overall um, success of the learning environment. So again, capturing all of that information helps. Um, I am going to go to the next document. So this is a course mapping document. This um, actual document example screenshot, and I didn't cite it, so I apologize for that, but I, it is on my in slides, I think. Um, it's Vanderbilt University. They have this course mapping document that they use. And you will see that there's different fields. Um, they have the module title, overview, you know, your School might use, like we use units and lessons, for example. Some places I've seen do chapter because they model more specifically after the textbook. Um, you know, it depends on your approach to your class. Uh, then they have the learning objectives or learning outcomes, depending on what you're using. Um, your teaching strategy, so how are you um, being intentional with how you're delivering that information with your learners. The activities and the assessments, so how are you going to get the information to them and how are they then going to interact with it and then any of the resources um, so if you have the nice thing about this is listing your artifacts and if every one of your artifact and what they're interacting with is just a reading assignment then you might have to step back and go okay now i need to look at my other toolkit and see what other activities or ways can i have them engage with this is there a video available that's made already? Can I create a video that they can watch and engage with um, as well? So there's ways to be able to um, 
determine what type of resources you need or can use and put with those lessons. The other field that they don't have on theirs, which I personally like to use, is time expectations. And I'll actually get to that a little bit more um, with one of the future questions, but definitely um, pieces to kind of think about as well. So you'll see on here I, on the left, I have some bullets, outcomes, activities, assessments, timeline, and time expectation, because that really summarizes well kind of what is included in there. Um, the nice thing about the Vanderbilt document is they even have those headers you'll see are actually linked to different resources. So when I was talking about your toolkit and your job aids, if you want more information on types of activities or resources, they have it structured where it links out to some of those different sources. So um, tools like that are very useful. This is not the only one that exists. So you might be able to search and find one that fits your approach or what you like better. But um, these type of tools really help you be intentional and deliberate as you're planning out your term. And as you can see, it's not, you know, every little detail, but it's enough to give you that pain plan and that roadmap of where you're going with your course. Um, the other thing I like about this is it helps me when I facilitate a class, I revisit this um, for my own self and then I will try to help the, the learners make connections between this because I'm very intentional. I put time into it and I'm hoping they're seeing the connections of how the topics fit together and the activities will help meet certain outcomes and then as this builds out and you have it from module to module, week to week, or even class to class, you can start to make connections between those and build um, additional either matrix matrices to kind of connect those together or um, just be able to refer. So, you know, back in module one, when we did this, this helped us prepare for what we're doing in module three because it was a scaffolded activity, which means we are building on, you know, just like your scaffolding, you build one step, next step, next step, and it provides additional opportunities. So those types of building processes are also very evident when you use this type of uh, course mapping document. So some of the fundamentals I'm, um, that I like to draw from are the community of inquiry, which I know you had um, seen before, and I will be giving um, Deb links to all of these, um, some of the different resources that I like that I think explain them in a palatable way. If your kind of education is not your primary field of study, um, there's ones that have it, that do a very nice job of keeping it simple and straightforward so that you can apply it as an instructor. Um, the four forms of interaction, that's learner, 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 instructor, learner content, and learner interface. Um, again, there's not a perfect formula of, oh, I need 25% of this, 25 of that, 25 of this. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It really depends on what your materials and subject matter is, but knowing that you have some diversification in the types of interaction you have and that you've given thought to it is very useful. Um, Merrill's first principles of instruction, those are, um, Merrill, Dr. Merrill did uh, research across a lot of theories and models and things out there and found some very common themes and trends. So it's really good to kind of think about those two where people are um, at or as you're building an activity. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're not jumping in at a higher level when the learners might not have the prerequisite knowledge or skills or know how to maybe go and use the research library, but you already have them executing research. Um, so thinking about how to scaffold that and how that instruction happens. So an example, uh, Merrill's first principles, it's really, he focuses on like solving a problem. So um, giving people a jumping off point, so activating former knowledge um, or giving them a starting point so that they can kind of ground there. And then they move into, you know, um, like a demonstration. So, you know, he talks about an instruction. A lot of times we will either demonstrate how to do something. We will illustrate it through a diagram. We will explain it in steps, but that all kind of goes into that demonstration. And then it's the learner's time turn, you know, it's their turn to do it, the, apply it, um, whatever that skill might be, and then integrate it into, 
you know, new situations. And that might sound familiar because the same type of thing happens when you move up your higher order thinking skills for Bloom's taxonomy. So I have that on here as well, because when you're writing outcomes and you're thinking about what you want them to do, those, um, there's uh, several different resources out there that have the different levels of Bloom's, but different action words that you can use that really, uh, help you hone in on what the expectation is and at what level you want someone to be able to demonstrate knowledge, skills, abilities, whatever it might be that you're aiming for. And then um, the last one I want to touch on is Gagne's events of instruction. There, there's nine events of instruction. So if you're looking at something that's very, um, might be a large concept and you're trying to figure out how to break it up or look at the different pieces, that one's very helpful in breaking it into its pieces and parts. So starting with um, being able to identify and then kind of moving all the way up again through the, the integration steps, but it breaks it down into the pieces and parts. So uh, another one that's very useful and people can associate with well as far as when they're thinking about how do I present this information. I'm going to go back for a second. Okay, I'm going to pause and see if there's any questions yet. Lots of questions. Let me let me pluck a few out for you. Okay, sounds great. Um, um, and, uh, um, and, and, so Gina asks, uh, how do you convert face-to-face -face class time to distance learning time? You know, how do you replace hours in one way to hours in the other? I'll, I'll just simplify it at that. <laughs> okay, that is a great question. It, um, I do have that a little bit later in the slides, but I will actually just touch on it now. Um, so when I'm looking at converting from one format to the other, um, it's not a straight one for one because you might be used to, okay, I'm going to go in the classroom. I have the learner's attention for an hour. I'm going to divide it up in this way. We're going to talk for 20 minutes. Then we're going to do a discussion activity or a worksheet or those types of, of, um, I guess interactions are going to occur during the or during the face-to-face -face class. In online learning, you have to, as a part of your plan, and that's why I like to be able to to um, capture in my course mapping document the time aspect of it. Because, okay, so let's say I'm going to have them watch a video that was already made. I already know how long that's going to be. Um, let's say it's a video that I'm creating. Um, I know what my end result is or we're going to have a class meeting and I know for 20 minutes we're going to talk about this and then maybe use breakout rooms because in Zoom you can have the breakout rooms or depending on what meeting software you might be using. Um, I think Blackboard Collaborate has it. Um, there's other tools out there that have similar types of meeting rooms. So if you have larger classes and you're breaking people up into smaller groups for discussions, um, you can kind of think, okay, how much time am I going to give them for that? So you're still able to then identify those activities just as you would in your classroom, but it might be a little bit um, different because you are putting them in a different space because they're not physically with you. It feels like it's different, but calculating that might not be as different. Now where it does become, um, I guess where it does become unique is if you are having them work asynchronously, you might be thinking, well, how do I, how do I calculate that? Um, there is a really cool tool and I'm going to show you later. I have a link to it and it's called the rice. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, the rice uh, university, they have created a tool and it does, it's called the workload calculator and you can put in there um, how many pages of reading you have them doing, what type of papers you're having them doing, all the different types of activities to figure out how much time a learner is putting into a class. So if you can figure that calculation out with what you know you're doing synchronously with them or watching videos or having them watch, you know, um, chunked videos, then you can come up with your overall calculation, which is useful. I've seen that tool and uh, Wake Forest has a similar one and, mm -hmm. and several people have taken that tool and, and made uh, variations on it. Yep. All right, here's, here's an easy question. Is the course map something you give students in lieu of the syllabus or is it just for uh, an instructor tool? Uh, primarily an instructor tool. Um, I have seen people take 
pieces and parts and put it in a format for the students. Um, an example, I do that, I guess, somewhat with my course calendar. So rather than just saying this date, this topic, this reading assignment, I actually list that it maps to specific course outcomes in there. Um, just because it helps give students an idea of those connections. Um, while it's easy for us to make those and connect the dots, it's not always as transparent as we think it might be, as, as, as we hope it might be for learners. So being able to help them make those associations gives them that, um, going back to uh, Merrill's first principles, gives them that activation. Oh, oh, that's right. It's related to this topic. Now I have a frame of mind or context when I go to work on it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Lots of people asking for links. Don't worry, folks. We will get them I from Julie. Them. We, we will torture her until she yields <laughs> these precious links and post them on the on the website. Um, uh, or, or you could or remember the very first tool that I talked about in my session. It's called Google. Um, <laughs> now, now I'll admit finding things like a, like like searching for course map won't get you very far, but but I was able to find some great course mapping tools by typing the word course mapping and Vanderbilt. Um, and, and also the, I found Rice's and Wake Forest's uh, course estimator, you know, that way. But don't worry, we will post all those in the session notes. So, um, and those are just some of my favorites. So, I mean, there, like you said, there's other ones out there. <laughs> yep. All right, go for it. All right. Okay, so how do I determine whether to make a class or content synchronous or asynchronous? Um, so if you have input into that or a choice, you wanna think about, bring it back to the type of engagement or the type of interaction that you want to have occur. If it's something that can be done where the students can watch it, read it ahead of time, um, you don't have to be sitting there with them, let them do that outside of class, make that asynchronous. Um, even if it's discussions amongst themselves, those can be done on the discussion board. And, it, and it's really nice to have those when there's, um, when you have a need for reflection or them to really process and try to integrate or even find sources themselves. Where it's nice to have the synchronous session is if, um, you want more of that improv or that in instinct, that reaction, because sometimes we want that, okay, let's discuss this now and I want you to respond and not have that processing time where they, you know, maybe analyze and overanalyze and that because part of the skills might be thinking on your feet and being able to draw from that knowledge that you have and being able to replicate that in a synchronous environment is going to be more beneficial to the learner than an asynchronous environment. So thinking about your activities in that way um, can make a difference. It's nice towards the beginning of a class to have some type of asynchronous component. I'll say that just for that um, social presence and establishing that initial rapport. People like to see each other's faces. They like to have or hear the voices, um, be able to get that personal connection that is sometimes missing in a purely asynchronous course. It can get there and it can evolve but you can get there faster in an ace or in a synchronous manner. So sometimes having that in the beginning and then move to asynchronous and then come back and visit the synchronous, um, being able to be strategic about when you're choosing which way to deliver the material is um, very, very useful um, as far as that goes. Um, other types of things you might want to think about synchronous or asynchronous is what tools you have at your disposal for those delivery formats. So that can sometimes open up a world of new things and at sometimes it can feel almost limiting because it doesn't necessarily provide the same opportunities. So getting to know what delivery tools you have available or can request and have available is useful. So I think that the fact that John mentioned earlier, there's gonna be some continuing sessions and dialogues and discussions. Those are the types of things that you can investigate further. Like, oh, I didn't know about this annotation tool. I can bring up one worksheet and everybody can contribute to it on the screen. We can save it when we're done in an asynchronous session, post it somewhere else for you know reflection or um, reference later. So there's ways to be able to use some of these interfaces um, that aren't present when you're in a physical classroom because not everybody can type on a document at once or not, um, you know, you, you don't get the same, the same uh, opportunities, I guess. 
What questions do you have kind of about the synchronous or asynchronous? I've got one for you. Sure. So folks are, um, and, and this is, this is an, an almost an impossible, this is a difficult question to answer. Uh, um, you know, uh, what, what about, you know, what about class discussions with everyone wearing a mask and sitting six feet apart? Um, you know, in other words, an attempt to preserve the face to face, but also deal with, uh, uh, you know, COVID. Um, is that realistic? Is that, I mean, I know a lot of schools are saying they're going to do it that way, but. Right. Um, and there's schools that are saying they're going to do it that way. And then they're going to do the, and I think I have this as a question coming up as well, but, um, we, um, they're thinking about doing that, but then even maybe having some people that are remote because you can only fit so many people in a classroom when you have them six feet apart versus. Yeah. High flex, right? Yeah. Um, the high flex model, um, you know, or being structuring it where, you know, people are doing labs and they're kind of flip-flopping around. Well, that becomes a little more complicated for the facilitator because they're kind of having to do the same thing maybe multiple times or have to prepare in a, a very different way, the way that they're chunking their material. So I think it's doable in the classroom. Let's say you have a small class with the size. Um, you just have to also keep in mind the, um, there's, there's different limitations that it causes. So let's say you have a learner in the classroom that's used to reading facial expressions, language, and, um, you know, if you're online, they have the text maybe that they can read, but when you have masks covering someone's face, it becomes harder sometimes to have dialogues. Um, so when you're looking at universal design concepts, it's, it's not impossible, but you might want to have other mechanisms to gauge people's understanding versus what you might have been used to in a face to face where you can really read all of the body language as far as I'm confused. I'm not confused. You know, I have questions, um, those types of situations. Sure. Sure. Do you, can you cover the same amount of material in an, in an online synchronous class as you do in a face-to-face -face class? We had a pre, I'll, 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 I'll warn you that we had a previous um, presentation where the law professor said that she, she, she knows she's going to have to strip out material from her online, entirely online class, um, just because of the difficulties of converting to an all online format. Um. I would say you can't necessarily, you don't necessarily want to make it one for one because it's going to be different. Some of the activities you're going to have might be different, um, but I wouldn't say they're removed from your class altogether. I think there's different ways that you can still, so when you're looking at your mapping document, you're going to have your overall course outcomes, what I want somebody to accomplish, and then I'm going to have my unit lesson or modules, the things that support those overall course outcomes. So when they do, um, if I'm looking at a different delivery format, in the standard face-to-face, -face, I might have, you know, A, B, and C that overall supports course outcome one. In the um, different delivery mode, maybe all online, maybe not any face-to-face, -face. I might have C, D, and E. So I have two that are the same, but the other two are slightly different, but they still reach the overall outcome of the class. So it doesn't have to be, and I think this is where we sometimes struggle as educators. We think, okay, I have to make it be the same activity, same type of outcome, no matter what the delivery modality is. And that's not the case. You can make it slightly different as long as you're getting to that same that same outcome. So, you know, the map to, <laughs> you know, wherever you're going, let's say you're going to Chicago from here to there, you know, from Springfield to Chicago and you're driving, there's a couple different ways you can go and that's fine. As long I, think as you're you're right. <laughs> I, I, I really think you're right because um, e even if we think that we're giving the same instruction to the students, the students are taking each their own path through the material. They're constructing their own educational environment, deciding what to read when, what to cover multiple times, which questions to ask. And so it, it's never really a perfect, everybody sees the same things at the same time sort of situation. It never was. We just assumed it was because we only saw one side of it, the, the instructor side. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's also where the, um, part of the instructional presence and that feedback, they call it, um, 
in the education literature, the dialogic feedback, but basically it's having a conversation with your learner about their progress and how their trip is going <laughs> versus just simple, here's your feedback, you're done, move on, making sure that it's a continued conversation throughout to be able to help guide those paths in those different ones because this person, you know, Johnny is um, bringing in a different experience than Paula because they had different backgrounds. So this concept resonated with this student where this concept resonated with this one. And so there's different gaps that they're trying to fill or be able to get to the same point. So there has to be some difference in how that occurs. Yep. Let, let me hit you with one last one. What about student preferences? Um, some of them prefer synchronous, some of them prefer asynchronous. Um, but, but, but how do you, how do you, how do you maintain, what's the word, uh, real, real time interaction for those who prefer not to be there in real time? Um, and, and <laughs> right. Um, and I think it becomes, you're not going to make everybody happy, <laughs> which is hard to swallow sometimes, but you know, and as much as we might want to, um, it, there's always going to be learning preferences. There's people that are going to respond to different activities um, more favorably than others. Some people love tests. Give me the test, get it done. I want to give you the info and I want to move on. And some people are like, ah, test. <laughs> Let me write a paper. I mean, I've had students flat out tell me that. Can I just write a paper? I don't want to, you know, and I don't give tests or quizzes much, but there's just the different preferences even in that type of thing. So I think your best opportunity to address that is to give um, varied or diverse types of activities. Now you don't want too many where it becomes an obstacle and it's like, okay, what are we doing today? What are we doing tomorrow? I'm, you know, that becomes overwhelming. Busy work, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's nice when you have kind of the routine and rhythm, but it's not the exact same activity or interaction happening every single time, because then that can be, isolating for one group of learners who might not prefer that way of learning or it doesn't it doesn't help them cognitively be able to kind of process through the information very good all right carry on all right oh actually so in here, I kind of, this kind of summarized, I forgot I had added the extra slide. Intent or goal of the activity, your interaction and your feedback loop can really help inform your choices there. So this goes back to the high flex. What if I have some students who are with me face to face and some are who remote? How do I engage everyone? Um, it is a little more challenging to get used to. Some tips and strategies I have for this. Um, read up a little bit on a high flex because there's a lot of, there's varied literature and resources, but people share lessons learned and tips and things that worked for them. Um, one thing that you're gonna have to kind of self-assess or evaluate is what do I have for a setup? A big limitation of implementing high flex in the past before we had COVID even to give people that flexible learning environment is um, the infrastructure or the technology that they have to be able to facilitate that. You know, a lot of classrooms have, a computer up front for the instructor, they have the desks so that students can bring their own devices and connect to the classroom, but there's not a good way um, to have a video that people can see the whole class or feel like they're part of the class if they're remote. You know, if everybody's remote, then everybody's in that same experience and you're presenting the information for that audience. When those audiences become different in modality or how that's being delivered, then the technology really needs to come into play to help make that happen. Um, I know there's institutions or places that are trying to figure that out, <laughs> how to get there in a short amount of time for fall, um, which is challenging because it's not a quick, easy, the perfect solution wouldn't be quick or easy. It's an investment in technology, um, but not to say it can't be done. Um, suggestions I have for people in working with the typical classroom setup, um, see if there's a way to um, get another device that you can set like on the back of a podium or something that kind of looks out to the class and have a separate login for that so that they can see and they can see the class if there's people raising hands asking questions and the instructor can also have their camera that's 
you know, focused up front. So they kind of get the full visual of the class. Um, there are some tools available that are becoming more reasonable um, as far as that goes that actually have the 360 cameras. Now, depending on how big your classroom is, if it's a big lecture hall, everybody's going to be this big, might not be as useful. If it's a smaller classroom, the ones with the 360 cameras can actually work fairly decent. Um, there's a company out there, um, we've used them for bigger meeting groups called um, OWL, and it's got the 360 um, camera. Um, as far as that goes, making sure if you're working with your class that you're having eye contact with, you know, not only your students in the classroom, but you're being intentional about wherever the camera's facing for your audience um, or your learners, your class that's out, you know, out in the remote world. Um, another suggestion I have is like in these sessions, it's wonderful. We have a moderator, you know, John, you're there helping questions. Elmer's there. If we have tech issues, you know, you have a team kind of helping. When you're in the classroom, it's you. <laughs> Most often, unless you're fortunate to have a teaching, a, a TA or, you know, that type of situation. If you have learners that are um, self-motivated, engaged, that are willing, you know, take advantage of that. See if they'd be willing to moderate. So, hey, today you're going to help and help advocate for the people that are at a distance to make sure I know when a question comes up. Um, to be able to clarify or say, hey, oh, they can't see you now. You moved off screen or they can't see your PowerPoint or, you know, that help kind of be that interaction um, since we don't necessarily have dedicated staff for it. But it doesn't mean somebody won't be willing to serve that role, because especially if they're going to be somebody where they get a chance to kind of reinforce concepts as well as they're communicating with the people at a distance. That's great. Um, I know we've done uh, online or like divisional meetings and we have remote some telecommute uh, employees. So what we've done is we've even had, um, we could still do breakout discussions in our class. We just have the people um, make sure somebody in that group has a device and they can, again, correspond with the other people in the group because they are part of that group even though they're remote because they're coming in via that device. If you have enough people remote, you can always do a separate breakout room just for them and then have the people that are in class um, be in their groups so that there's still group activity and they get the learner learner benefit. One thing of caution of that is you want to be very conscientious ahead of time like, okay, we're going to do this for 10 minutes and I'm going to stick to it and not go, oh, looks like everybody's done, we're gonna start, and all of a sudden you forgot about the online group that's still meeting, because I've seen that happen. <laughs> it's not fun <laughs> to have that uh, be kind of forgotten about. So, you know, being intentional that you kind of stick to a timeline or you stick to the activities um, that you've planned ahead of time to make sure that everybody gets to be involved or in, engaged in it. So I think those are some of the tips as far as, um, if you have those different audiences, it doesn't mean things can't happen. You just have to be very intentional of putting on the hat. Okay, I'm in the classroom. Okay, now I'm the person that's remote. What, what do they need to know? Oh, I'm giving out a handout. I better make sure I have that electronically that either they can get it in advance or somebody in the classroom can email it to them right away or give them access to it via the chat link or sending files through whatever, um, synchronous tool you're using. So just those types of little things that you have to kind of remember um, is useful. So what other questions do we have about the kind of high flex and engaging everyone? Um, 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 I don't know if you saw it, but uh, um, um, whole, uh, Mike Caulfield put out a video just a couple of days ago mm -hmm. in which he, he centered, he centered that he, he, he centered this whole problem around whether you're like asynchronous or synchronous. How do you move from face to face to high flex? And instead he called it, he calls his model zoom flex, which is hilarious. <laughs> but basically the class is centered around a Google doc. Um, and you could even work it where, you know, uh, you could even work it where, where you're in the classroom and other people, or you're not in the classroom, teaching to a room full of people who are in a classroom, but because everybody's taking notes and asking questions inside a shared Google Doc, that's the way you get the learner-to-learner -learner interaction. Mm -hmm. um, yep, that and that, yeah, that's a wonderful technique to be able to have a collaboration document like that, especially if everybody has devices, you know, the people in the classroom and outside the classroom. 
yeah. That's... Yeah, there has to be some sort of online space where that where that connection is 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 happening. There's um, even technologies and tools out there now. Um, I'm trying to think who the vendor. There's I want to say two vendors at least now that have it. But you can have your streaming video and you can have people asking questions so it comes in at a certain point and it's time stamped. So then even if people replay the video later, if they aren't able to make it, they can see questions in context of timing of the video and then mm -hmm. responses can be also typed in. One of, them's called, one of them is called VoiceThread. Um, it's not mm -hmm. free, uh, but, it, but it allows uh, asynchronous people to drop small bits of video into the stream of existing video such that the instructor can see their video response. So, so it's the equivalent of like if you're, if you're talking to your class on Zoom and somebody else watches it later, they can drop a little bit of a video that's an answer to a question there and, and, and in effect be participating, although not in purely real time. Voice thread. Right. If you just Google that word, um, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. And there's Here's another one I want to say with Go React, and um, I want to say Media Media Site now has come out with some type of tool that's similar for the streaming interaction, or they were working on it. I'm not positive if it's out yet. <laughs> yeah, and to be and to be clear, folks, um, I, I I'm I'm I love new technologies, but but I also I also hate being jammed up if, with with some I don't know which button to push or what button to tell people. And being a tech support person, while I'm also an instructor, and so so there's there is the the complexity cost of adopting things like this. Yeah. Um, you know, the simpler, obviously, the better. Yeah. So how uh, well, there are a lot of questions about scheduling, though, and and I know. Okay. Some people don't have a choice in their scheduling. You know, they're being handed, you're teaching this time or, you're, or, or something. But is, are there any better ways to schedule synchronous and asynchronous or courses that are high flex? I mean, is it okay to sort of yank students around? I think I know the answer to that. You know, <laughs> different, different times every week, um, if that's your only yeah. option. The more routine you can have it where that time doesn't become a guess or a question of when things are due or when certain activities are going to be involved, the better it is for the learner because then they're focusing on the content and the meaningful, substantive kind of interactions that you want them to for the class and not just a, like you're saying, where am I at? Which button am I pushing? Did I get, <laughs> can I see everybody? Can I respond? You don't want that to be the anxiety that the learners or you as the instructor are having, you know, do I have everybody? <laughs> because that can even become a question. Uh, you know, am, am I missing students just because they're not sure where to be and I'm not sure who's supposed to be here. Um, so I think the more people can work with their organizations to try to have a structure that is, it becomes some type of routine and it is a common structure and it's not just floating every week um, will be to the benefit of the learner and the faculty. Yep, yep, very much so. Um, there's a lot of questions about feedback on, and microphones, which um, I'm, I'm not gonna try to answer uh, right now. I think that's more sort of a Friday tech sort of mm -hmm. thing to talk about, because it's, it's, it's tricky to explain, but but the, but, the, but, the, but the short answer is everybody should be on headphones if they're all in, even if they're all in the same room together, because mm -hmm. then there's crosstalk of what I'm saying going into the microphone that's in the PC next to me um, and such like that. And so the more headphoned everybody is, the less, the less that crosstalk will happen. Right. Is, is there any good reason to do high flex if you're not required to by your institution? Isn't it better to put everybody online or everybody you know, face to face, if, 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 you, if you have the choice? Boy, that's a tough one. Um, I think as an instructor, it might make it easier for us, but for some of the learners and the environment we're in today, it doesn't necessarily make it easier for everyone. It doesn't make it accessible for everyone. Um, if you require one format or the other, if you do high flex and the idea before all of this COVID and everything happened was learners could then have some choice in the way that they learn. So if they wanted to purchase, um, I know there was places that were looking at if they had somebody who wanted to come to class all the time, they could. And if they had somebody who needed to be online all the time, they could. 
or, you know, there was more um, discretion given to the learner as far as how they wanted to do that or the flexibility, I guess I should say, to the learner um, versus it being situational like it is right now. Yep, I, I, I can see I can see that the, the future is fraught for <laughs> everything after even post COVID after this all people are going to say, you know, why do I have to show up? Why can't I zoom in? Um, the courts I know are already looking at that. You know, why, why are we making everybody come to our courtroom when we could just do this through zoom now that they have some experience in how relatively easy it is uh, given it. And, and I got to believe that's going to happen in education too. Students are going to say, I demand accommodation or I request it or require it. And, you know, and I'm yeah, paying I think we're gonna... money. And, and it's going to be harder to say no when it's apparently easy to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I have an answer here, just that I could see problems in our future. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I mean, across everything from education to the workplace, you know, telecommuting for some organizations, just it was a huge culture shift for them to be able to offer that as an opportunity. And now that people have been exposed, I think it's um, yeah, you're going to have some people that are really going to want it and some that are going to maybe not have had as positive experiments or experiences and maybe very adamantly <laughs> on the other side too. So. Yep. Yep. So uh, are you, are you are ready we, to finish up? Sure. I didn't know I was going to ask how we were doing for time. Cause I know we kind of were off a little bit. So we're, yeah, we're running a little late because of our own technical glitch. So, <laughs> you know, maybe 10 minutes or so. Okay. We can do that. Um, so we talked about the time estimate, and I think I've already kind of addressed this, addressed this one. So this was that um, RICE, the workload um, estimate that I, or the tool that I had um, talked about before. And let's see if I can get it to, I may have to stop and then reshare. Let me see if I can get it to come up. All right. Um, all right is it up on the screen we'll see yes, yes it is okay good so just to give people an idea of this because i think sometimes when you talk about it versus seeing this one it makes it a little harder to kind of comprehend what what all they have in there um, but you'll see they have the reading the writing you know exams other types of activities kind of the catch-all <laughs> um, and then the other part that I think is nice is they even break it down by, well, what if this is a really hard concept that's going to take longer? Or, um, you know, are we really doing a survey where we're getting an awareness or are we going into deep involvement and interaction with either the reading or writing or what we're doing? So it's really nice that it can break it down in that way. Um, as far as that goes and even your writing so is it single space double spaced you know how many words are you expecting <laughs> there's ways to be able to um you know pick that and be able to see so let's say each week i'm like oh yeah i'm gonna give them 100 pages and um you'll see my hours over here starts to change and they're gonna write you know a couple 40 page papers <laughs> um that are gonna be arguments so you can see wow that really made it jump up. So it really gives you a good idea of looking at um, the pieces and parts in that lesson plan. And that's why I like to have the field where I can capture that and kind of see how is that um, being calculated. And you'll see down here, it even kind of gives you a suggestion of reading rate. So where somebody is at or what the average is for reading, writing. If you think their estimates off, you can actually manually adjust it. So it's a pretty comprehensive tool. Um, so I always just like to kind of mention that to people. And like you said, there's other ones out there. This isn't the only one. This just happens to be one that I frequently use, um, but definitely something to keep in mind uh, as you're preparing, because I mean, even for me, every once in a while, I'll put something in and I'm like, whoa, that <laughs> is completely, you know, not what I intended to have as a result for workload. So then I will make an adjustment. And, um, and I'm sure it makes things easier for me and the learners when, we can do that in a more manageable and reasonable amount of time um, as well. One thing I do want to mention as well, when you're planning your time and your learner's time, also think about from the faculty standpoint, how long it's going to take you to give feedback on that type of activity. 
So if it's writing and being able to read 20 pages or 40 pages or 60 pages versus, you know, maybe somebody actually has to give an oral um, presentation or share out a discussion. There's a tool called Flipgrid that people are using where they, again, it's the video type of thing where they can do a little video response and you get these little tiles of all the people and they can do their responses and share and then people can respond. Um, so those types of activities, when you have the peer-to-peer -peer interaction, all that feedback doesn't have to come from you as the instructor. You can have that feedback come from their peers, which is valuable for them because it reinforces concepts. Um, they get to hear from their peers, which, you know, students actually enjoy. It's not, you know, just hearing from the instructor, instructor the whole time. They like to be able to interact with each other. It respects for adult learners, um, respects their knowledge and their experience. So think about that when you're deciding on activities that you want to do um, as well. Like I like the think, what we call think, pair, share, but you give them topics, they pair up, they discuss, and then they come out and you have them talk with the bigger group and actually um, kind of have a debrief in that aspect. And again, you're getting that feedback, that dialogue, and it's not all on you as the instructor. You're kind of facilitating, make sure people aren't way off pace, but it's a very valuable exercise. Um, the other one that I like to do is um, the muddiest point. So at the end of a lecture, I might say, hey, what are you still confused on? Um, and give people a chance. That's where the Zoom tool, the polling is really cool. You can do the anonymous, just like you said, <laughs> and you can say, okay, these are the topics we covered today. Which things are you still confused about? Which things do you just want more information? And you know, how was the pace of today's class? Or some type of question like that that gives you as the instructor good formative feedback, especially now since we're moving into newer learning environments for us. We're human. Let them see that you're human. That's okay. Um, it's appreciated, you know, that everybody, you know, knows everything doesn't have to be perfect from what you're presenting as the instructor. Um, sometimes that's where people get hung up when they're creating. I think one of the questions um, I had seen out there was, how long does it take to create media and things like that? Well, they can, the statistics vary, but some will say four minutes to every one minute of media to actually produce it. So that could be a lot, <laughs> depending on how much you're actually creating your videos, but the better plan you have, the um, being nice to yourself and not thinking it has to be perfect. <laughs> um, it's not this big polished presentation or movie on TV. That's okay. If you were in front of the classroom and you bobbled, you'd move on. <laughs> Just because it's recorded doesn't mean you have to stop back now and re-record that piece. Um, you know, you could acknowledge it and move on. Don't apologize because again, you're, you're human. It's okay. Um, and, you know, keep that going. So keep that in mind that while the education in these pieces are a science, there's an art and there's the natural perfection and the imperfection, I'll call it. <laughs> I like that phrase. Um, let's see. Okay. back to this. So other things, um, so this is kind of the last question here. Um, as far as, you know, what you can use. Um, one thing, and I'm not sure how much in education there is, um, I'm sure it kind of varies, or in um, the law field with like open educational resources and information and materials you can bring in to class, but don't think that you have to create everything from scratch. So if you have your resources from your face-to-face -face classroom that aren't in an electronic delivery mode, see what else is out there. You know, do kind of a scan, like you said, search. Um, see who you can partner up with that might be willing to, hey, we're both covering this topic. Let's tag team and kind of share resources. So there's a lot of collaboration, networking, and things like that that can go on to help with moving in these modalities as well. So what other questions, John? I know we're almost here at time, so I want to make sure if there's any last pressing questions. I've been I've been answering some of them. There there's some some technical things. Um, I, I think I think that this is this is a good point to uh, you know unless folks uh, uh, want to pop something in right now. I mean, mostly I, I sense I sense uh, I, I sense you know they're frustrated at, at not knowing what what the best way to do is. But but you you really you 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 touched on something that that I realize is a huge deal here. 
we have spent you know, uh, I'm old enough. I'm uh, 59. So I've spent my entire life and I spent my 20 whatever years in grammar school, high school and college uh, practicing and learning one modality for how teaching works, which is a, a faculty member in the front of the room. You know, so all of us have spent all those years in that way of doing things. And now we're doing something different for, in some cases, for the first time. And so we naturally feel uh, uh, like this is a, um, an undiscovered country or, or a foreign country to us. And that is just going to be the way it is. Now, 10, 20 years in the future, when we're all just popping in and each out of each other's lives automatically, you know, through virtual reality, you know, we'll laugh at this video that somebody will <laughs> pop up and make jokes about. Look what they did in 2020. They were idiots. You know, but for now we're going to live this, um, and and I and I and I guess I just want to say we can, we we can we can do we can do this, folks. This is this is this is uh, a little bit uh, easier than rocket science, and um, and we're when we're all smart people, and we're all in this together. You know, to work together to make it to make it work, um, and and uh, and I, and I hope that you take away from this class and from Julie's talk and from all of our speakers. That that there are there is uh, there there's something to be done and, and there's a skills to be learned in how to do this in this new modality and that's all I've got to say. Julie, you got any last thoughts? No, I I would just say the biggest thought I have is to be kind to yourself um, as you're going through this. Um, take baby steps. It doesn't have to be everything at once. It's not going to be perfect. If you think of the first time you ever taught, even in a face-to-face -face classroom, it probably wasn't perfect. And that's okay. That's, that's part of the process of learning to teach. You know, we try to make it the best we can, but then we think, oh, I can do this and I can tweak this and make it better. But that's what's good about education and good instructors is you're continually refining. Um, and that's, that's okay. The same thing applies in this environment that it did in your face-to-face. Yep, yep. And by taking this class, uh, you you have all added to a skill set, and you've be, you've made yourself more of an asset to your deans and your institutions, who mm -hmm. who who may be who may not be able to give you clear information, and who are struggling to figure out as an institution how to get through this. Um, you know, they're they're scared that the students aren't going to show up if they if they pull an all online situation um, and that will cause great financial stress um, that fear is not unreasonable um, and but 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 it's but it's not that's not entirely your responsibility to figure out but it is your you're on the team to help be an asset to to whatever situation your institution whatever course your institution takes um, so so that's my final advice is be an asset <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's it. Thank you, Julie, so much. That was wonderful. Folks will be posting this video up and uh, all the videos, we'll, we'll leave them up for the for, forever. Uh, for, so if you have faculty who you think could benefit from these, have them go to the website and watch the videos. Uh, we, we, we pull all the links out and we'll do the same with uh, Julie's talk and, and post them. Um, and come to our Friday tech support open house sessions. Uh, we'll be posting links on that on this website as well, the online teaching.classcaster.net and on the Cali website. Um, if, if too many of you show up, um, oh my God, uh, we'll figure something out. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll have, you know, Wednesday, Friday sessions. Um, uh, but, but it's going to be a loose, uh, loose sort of casual sort of environment rather than this formal webinar sort of thing. And it will be using Zoom meetings so you'll have to turn your cameras on so we can look at your faces and uh, yell at you uh, or be yelled at, I guess. Uh, thank you very much, Deb. Thank you for all your hard work on this. My God, I can't believe you pulled it off. And uh, thanks, Elmer, for all the tough stuff that we threw at you at the last minute. Um, and thank all of you who, who attended. Um, good luck. Thanks, Julie. Yep, thank thanks, you. Julie. Thank you for inviting me. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, -bye.